Uh, we do have time for some uh, questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first is, I think that in this country we sort of have a dichotomy in our relationship with drugs. On the one hand, as you said, we see it as an evil thing, uh, a bad thing. On the other hand, we're only one of two countries in the world that advertises prescription drugs in the media, on television. So I think there's sort of a dichotomy of our relationship with drugs as a country, which I would like you all to speak to. And then the other um, question or statement is about mandatory drug testing. So I, I have sort of a, um, a preconceived idea that I'm not particularly fond of mandatory drug testing because I think there are issues of civil liberties, um, privacy, um, I think it sort of goes against what we stand for. In other words, we think, we, as a country, we believe you're innocent until proven guilty. I think mandatory drug, drug testing is the opposite. You're guilty until proven innocent. But all that said, so you kind of understand where I'm coming from, um, we, companies spend millions of dollars drug testing. And most of the people, for a tiny sliver percentage of people that they find using drugs, um, could that money be better spent in terms of offering services rather than trying to just weed out that percentage of people in the company that are using it? All right, panelists, we have two hot potato questions uh, here. Uh, and uh, each uh, shall answer. The questions are about uh, advertising pharmaceuticals on TV and mandatory uh, drug testing. Kathy, why don't you tackle the, uh, uh, each of them? Uh, I think the first question about uh, the dichotomy is, is really telling and, and really interesting. We love our drugs that are prescribed. We love them. They cannot make them fast enough until they become bad. And everybody, you know, and there's a sense that they're abused. So it's, we love them hate. I mean, I think the love-hate relationship that the United States has had with drugs is, is, extended back throughout our history. And I think it's very it's something that's very difficult to overcome. So I mean, I think they're really actually uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, I, I, people do feel, there was an interesting article in the New York Times about um, Valium and, and you know, how um, using Valium in, in the age of anxiety starting in the 1960s, you know, we learned to medicate for things that were kind of just normal, everyday occurrences. Um, not to say that, you know, benzodiazepines don't have their place, but I, I really think that's a, a, you hit the nail on the head with that. And I think until we get a more of a, oh, in, instead of seeing the commercial and saying, hey, I want some of that, go ask your doctor, you know. Um, until we learn to not turn to substances for or again for every issue in our society, I think, in, or in ourselves, and blame them for problems in society, I think um, we're always going to have that kind of problematic issue with drugs. Should I, should yeah. I, yes, my about the... The urine testing, um, you know, I, my, my feeling is um, I know that urine, urine testing can help folks in treatment programs, you know, monitor, right? So, but um, the rollout of, of, of drug testing programs throughout society makes me extremely uncomfortable. I, I, I feel that um, turning over my urine in a cup to someone, something you know that contains a lot of information about me, am I pregnant, do I have a chronic condition, um, you know, and I, I'm not saying that they're testing for these things, but 40 years ago people would have been outraged by this. And, and I think that when you talk to college students and people um, who have grown up in this environment, to them, to hand over um, their bodily fluids is completely normal. I don't think that it's completely normal, and I find it a violation of civil liberties. I do think there's a ton of money being spent on this. And in fact, we just had um, a recognition of Overdose Awareness Day um, out in the suburbs, and I had a drug company that said, hey, you know what, we'd like to give back to the community. We will offer free drug testing kits to all of the family members 
And, and here's the question that I have when people start talking about wide-scale wide drug testing. What do you do with that information? You know, what, like, what does a parent do with that information? You know, and what is the relationship between the employer and does it erode the relationship? Does it erode the relationship between a parent and a child if you do drug testing? I, so, I mean, that's the question I have. What do you do? Do you, you know the person's using and perhaps you refer them to services, but perhaps making services more available might be a more cost-effective solution. Bill, which one are you more motivated to answer? Well, they're both really, you know, I, I think any time the World Series comes on and, and a five-year-old kid who watches the World Series knows all the words of the Viva Viagra song, <laughs> it, 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 is, it is indicative of our country's problem with drugs. You know, we, everyone wants to solve every problem by taking a pill, whether it's the Prozac generation or the Xanax. I mean, I, my wife was, is a social worker at University of Chicago, and they came out with a new antidote. This is when we first met 20-some-odd years ago. And they came out, one of the pharmaceutical companies came out and said, we have this new drug that's not addictive. Well, within a couple of years, it was clearly addictive, and they were, you know, they were backtracking. So I couldn't agree more. We have a psychotic relationship with drugs. We want, as Americans, we want a fast, simple solution to the most complex problems. We want a pithy response to a complicated situation, and we want it to be clever and witty, and, and I'm sure Mitt Romney and uh, Barack Obama are both working on clever, witty responses for tomorrow's debate that will mean nothing. Um, but that's a cultural issue. With regard to drug testing, I don't disagree with some of the points that have ma been made. I think that drug testing is a shortcut. And drug testing is a shortcut to good parenting, and drug testing is a shortcut to good supervision in the workplace. If supervisors in the workplace consistently did their job and identified people who have problems and dealt with them directly, um, there wouldn't be much need for drug testing. That will happen right after we stop singing Viva Viagra. I mean, the world I live in is a real reality world, and it's, it's, people will use drugs and supervise. I can tell you story after story of people coming, like a nurse manager who told me about one of her nurses who used to come to work a little bit drunk. She had three years of documentation on this nurse who came to work a little bit drunk. I'm appalled. She had, but she was awesome at, at assessing the problem. She was phenomenal at documenting the problem, but she didn't have the wherewithal. She didn't have the internal capacity to, to, to actually directly confront the person and deal with the problem. That's what drug testing is. It's a shortcut to good supervision and good management. And unless people change profoundly in very short order, I don't see a way around that. Yeah. How's that for uplifting? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Okay, a couple of really good questions. Um, I think part, not only is there advertising for drugs, but one of the thing, one of the ways in which we as a society kind of um, go wrong in our prevention messages is that we are afraid to admit that drugs and alcohol actually make people feel better. And that's why we've had as a society, as human beings, um, of uh, a long and um, unbroken relationship with mind-altering substances. Okay, they make us feel better, and it's and it's when it becomes problematic, as in denial of reality, and when it becomes problematic, as in you know substituting for relationships and problematic and hurts our health and or you know our our, our finances and everything else that we react. And so. Um, so the audience will always be there, whether it is on television or anywhere else. And I think we have to honestly assess um, what and why we're going after, it, why we have this ongoing relationship with mind-altering substances. I just, we do. It does, it, it, and we, I don't mean Americans, I mean people. From time immemorial, caffeine, chewing on coca leaves, it doesn't matter, right? Um, and that's not a solution to the problem. It's just a part of informing the conversation honestly um, so that we can actually talk about a strategic solution rather than simply banning things. Banning things results in criminal justice system-like responses. And I'm not a fan of that, even though that's where I make my living. And as it relates to um, uh, the pervasiveness of drug testing, we use it. We use it 
often. We use it diagnostically. We use it as supervision and monitoring. Um, but I'm going to talk about it just for a second from the perspective of um, my son, who's a Marine, and my kids who were in sports in school. And that is to say that the threat or promise, whatever you want to call it, of drug testing gave them one more um, weapon in a battle against peer pressure to misuse substances. They, they, by the way, were never drug tested. So they were athletes and everything else. So random drug testing, I don't know. Pervasive drug testing, I don't know. But just the possibility and the threat of it um, has made it pos easier for them to say no to friends who um, uh, apply pressure to experiment. Not even re regularly used, but experiment with drugs. So, you know, it, it can serve a function in, in that regard as well. I don't disagree with the concerns about um, civil liberties. I don't disagree with concerns about privacy. I don't think our definitions of privacy have kept up with um, our legal definitions or our ethical definitions of privacy have ca actually kept up with a changing world either. So I think we also need to confront and address that. And urine testing is just one piece of that complicated I just, debate. I, I just want to add, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of nuances to the drug testing phenomena as well. Uh, you know, I ran an adolescent drug treatment program for four years. When, when schools started doing testing for kids who were in, in ex, uh, extracurricular activities, I was horrified. Because I work with so many kids where the only thing that kept them engaged with school was the band, was the football team, was the track team. And if they got drug tested and got kicked out of that sport, they had nothing that held them to the school, nothing that bound them in any meaningful way because that thing had been what held them in. So I, you know, I still, when I hear about academic or school drug testing programs, it frightens me because I think that there are so many negatives or downsides. But, the, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, the companies that make the drug testing kits were selling kits where you could cut hair from your kid's head while he slept at night and send it off to a lab. Now, you know, when I read that, I thought, if you're going into your kid's room to cut their hair at night, there's a problem. You don't need to send it for a test. You've got a problem. Okay? It's, it's self, it's apparent. You've got a bigger problem maybe than just the drugs because if you're willing to go into your child's room at night and take at their hair. At every level. <laughs> Let me see if we have some other questions. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, actually, I have a question and I agree on your comment that the primary care physician doesn't know what's like I guess practical. I'm a physician. I work in an inpatient setting and I have like so many patients that um, they like um, overuse like prescription drugs like narcotics because they come some in like kind of disease grips that you have to admit them and then they are allergic to on on other like all pain medications I don't know you know that you have to like and then they are in pain they are rating their pain kind of out of the pen and then you have to give like narcotics and then you end up like discharging them with like a week or two weeks and I mean uh, you see like they go to another ho hospital even though you don't give uh, like prescribing refills they go to another physician to another doctor and then, you know like kept getting these prescription medications uh, so this is the ones uh, we identify, but there's like a lot of people we don't identify, and I agree that we don't have much in our training to identify this. So what would you recommend, like what are the training models available for physicians? And the other thing is, even if we identify, you want to talk to them, they, they're not, never interested to talk to them. Well, I think there's two points that physicians really can intervene. When they're prescribing um, narcotic, you know, uh, opioids, yeah. that to really make it clear what an opioid is, and you know, um, to talk about the risk of dependency and talk about it clearly. Like, what does dependency mean? Most people in this room are like, dependency. Well, well, that's bad. Yeah. You know, but what is withdrawal like? What is it going to feel like if you get physically dependent on this drug and you have to stop and you ta stop taking it? What does that syndrome look like? I think if you describe that, people might be more afraid to take the drug and they might. And it's also. They, yes. Well, so there are people who are drug seeking, and then, but then there are people who are not yes. drug seeking, who might find that they're medicating for a problem, and then they're like, "Oh, and I feel better too." Do you understand? There. So, so I think it's also really important because 
you know, so many medications say, do not drink with alcohol, do not drink with alcohol. But people say, ah, whatever, drink with alcohol. You know, what does that mean? And so I think doctors have, it's a good, when you explain, drinking, taking this opioid medication with alcohol, which is also depressing, can make you dead. I think just saying that would, would really, you know, um, maybe stop people from mixing drugs. Because I think that, you know, these little slap on labels, you know, don't really convey the message, but doctors would be listened to. If, in, in, and I know that doctors have no time. They have, they have negative time to talk to people, you know. But I think in 30 seconds, just explaining, do you know what physical addiction is? This is a withdrawal syndrome. Where do you get more training? Oh, Lord, I hope there is going to be a place for that because I know that, you know, in medical school and residency, the amount of training is less than half a day related to yeah. substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. and I, it's just, I mean, it's, I, I don't even understand how we can do this as a society when we consider this to be such a uh, significant problem. So I hope that as ACA um, moves forward that we will see more training and retraining of, of doctors. Before I close, any other comments? I'd just like to piggyback on that. Um, it is clear to me, not just that there's um, doctor shopping, et cetera, but doctors um, <coughs> give too much medication and, and routinely, routinely refill scripts that don't need yes. refills. Um, and so for, um, for oral surgery, for your dentist, okay, not a doctor, but for, like for oral surgery or something, I know people can get, will get routinely 30 days of pain meds yes. for an, or a surgical procedure, oral surgery. Three days max. Don't give them 30 days. Yes. Because I it's agree. not that necessarily that that person's going to use the rest of the prescription. Someone else. Someone else is going to get it. And and that's the other thing that doctors can do is be um, much more uh, uh, restricted in the amount of pain meds that you give out. Uh, it, it's it's a, the stories I've heard. I was just with my mother this weekend who said she has to tell the pharmacy to stop automatically refilling her meds just because she has a prescription. And, you know, most people don't actually take them all as prescribed. So if you get them every 30 days, you've got about, you know, you've got way too much medication. So, and I know that's an individual strategy, but it's why there's so many um, opiate meds out there that people are getting addicted to, just unused meds. Yes. Do you have a closing comment? Well, I, I just want to, I, I, I echo that because I work with nursing homes and hospice providers. And boy, you talk about second income streams. If you work in a hospice situation and you can scoop up all the medications after the person's passed away, <laughs> you can make a lot of money, and people do. <laughs> um, because, and so, you know, I, I, one of my hospital clients, we arrange, we go out and do training for their docs once a year. For two hours, we get to talk about the newly, as soon as you become eligible to write your own scripts, we go out and do training for the docs there. We get a, maybe a two-hour block. But there are lots of training opportunities. There's some, we have some phenomenal docs in the Chicagoland area who, you know, whether it's uh, Dan Angris, Tom Reedy, um, Andrea Barthwell, who are really phenomenal docs who come in and do ASAM training, ASAM training and are phenomenal. They're wonderful. So. Well, let's give our panelists a... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.